What's up, gangsters? How about another episode of the foil adventure with this little 148th uh, Edward Mustang? Uh, this episode's going to be long. It's all about uh, the laminar flow wing and how I filled in those pesky panel lines that Edward so generously gives us on this kit. So, we better get right to it. Okay, here we go. Back at it. I have been... Uh, doing the next phase of this, which is the initial bits of body work. Uh, the usual subjects uh, are involved. My Infini sanding sponge sticks. Uh, always great. Um, my very nice and sharp and very dirty needs to be cleaned Sujibori Do file. A UMP sanding stick and some Infini sanding sponge in a gripper tweezer for that uh, precision work. So I think it's instructive to look at things like this kind of uh, at each phase. Um, and I've pretty much done all of the, the uh, initial body work. And, and what I mean by that is just anything that's basically material removal, sanding, filing, scraping, whatever, before you make the decision to use any filler because to me that's you know filler is is always supposed to be a method of last resort so you can see i've uh, finished off the spine here i've got a couple little pinholes i need to take care of the uh the nose is is pretty well polished off i was trying to preserve what rivet detail was there but it's a lost cause so just got to get next to uh, having to reinstate that. There was a little bit of a step right here on the bottom of the scoop and some uh, and somebody on uh, Facebook mentioned that to me as well so not the only one to see that um, and uh, took care of uh, the chin and another you know case where you just kind of have to resign yourself to obliterating detail and then fixing it uh, rather than trying to preserve it because that's just a that's just a fight you're not going to win. The uh, other thing was I had a little bit of a step still on the at the wing root joint, but it was on the wing side, and it was only right here at the front, and it was mostly on the left wing. So you can see, I think I have a pretty... It's going to be tough to get the camera to focus right there apparently but uh got a pretty pretty nice uh pretty nice even wing root you can i think look along there and see that it's pretty good just the 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 uh uh right hand side is just damn near perfect all the way along um hard to find fault with much of any of that there's a little bit of a wing side step right there but that's not too bad uh, had a little bit of a high spot there and matt mcdougall found that both sides of his wing had a little bit of a fuselage side step and what he did is what i also had to do a little bit of right here which was basically just raise the top skin of the wing a, a bit and he stuffed some sponge into this gap I didn't need that much. Um, I put a 5,000th evergreen shim right in there, and that took care of that. And somebody asked me, well, is, did you take too much off the top of the wheel well box? No, because that's not where I was doing it. In fact, I didn't touch any of that right there. All of the material that I removed from the top of the wheel well box was along here, which, as I mentioned, I had to do to get the leading edge to close up completely and you can see that it looks pretty good on the right hand side this side again i had to do it uh, i had to i had to angle it basically because it needed to be closed all the way over here by the guns but not over here at the wing root so that's that ten thousandths uh evergreen shim in there so uh, it's all good. I'm at the point now where I'm ready to start doing some filling. Um, oh, one thing I should mention. Remember that thing that I did where I thought I was being super clever by putting those uh, little lips in there on both sides uh, right there so that when you put the uh, 
the wing in, it would force the, uh, the back part of it to line up underneath here uh, with this uh, little ridge right here by the scoop. I'm talking about right in there. You can see where it's a little high uh, right in there and you can fix that by just kind of popping it down. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, this was a case of uh, me being too clever for my own good because it worked great until I glued up the, uh, the scoop. Uh, and once all of this was all firm and stiff, uh, yeah, didn't work anymore. In fact, the way that you kind of have to put the wing in there is you drop it in at an angle like this, and once it's all the way in there, then you kind of hinge it shut. And you can't do that <laughs> with those little pieces that I had added in there. So yeah, anyway, I just had to go ahead and remove those. No big deal. So anyway, that's where it's at there. And uh, now it'll be on to uh, a little bit of actual filling and some spot priming. And we'll see what it looks like at that point. But before I move on, <laughs> here's kind of a funny thing. You guys remember in episode one, uh, I showed all of the sprues in detail and some of the issues, one of which was that the uh, exhaust stubs, stacks, whatever you want to call them, were defective. Uh, and so I emailed Edward. Uh, they were very responsive like the next day. They sent me a, re a reply telling me that they would send me some replacement parts, um, and uh, they did. In fact, a couple of days ago, I got this box uh, with some uh, sprues in it, but yeah, do you see what's wrong with this? <laughs> Look closely. Yeah. Right color, wrong plane. <laughs> These are Spitfire Mark I sprues. <laughs> so yeah, oops, just a little bit of an oversight on somebody's part. Not a big deal, I have plenty of time, so I'll send them another message and ask them to resend these. But in the meantime, you know, we get a little bit of a look at the new Mark I sprues. And the molding on these is also fantastic, just like it is on the uh, Mustang parts. Really good, really nice and crisp. Uh, details, those are the sidewalls. They look really, really good. Lots of little bitty cockpit parts there that look, that look great. Uh, I think that one of the issues that people were having with these uh, Spitfire uh, parts is that the exhaust stacks on these were showing some sink marks and yeah you can kind of see that there uh, and what happens it's a it's a molding design and and process issue um, I mean they can't they can't really mold or design around it with these exhaust stubs because um, they have to be as thick as they have to be but where it typically happens is on sections that are extra thick. Like you can see uh, here where the uh, 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 number of, for the sprue thing is, that's extra thick and it did not, uh, did not fill all the way. Uh, that, that's partly not filling and partly uh, uh, sink mark shrinkage. And what that is, is it's just the mold not being packed out completely tight. You know, they're just not shoving enough material in there, holding it for the right amount of time. It's a cooling and shrinkage issue. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on running an injection molding machine. I just know these things in general. And it is essentially a process issue at that point. And, you know, it's just something that they have to try to dial in. So hopefully they'll get that figured out. But look, that's not really that bad. I mean, you could definitely have worse issues than uh, that little bit of sink on, on those uh, exhaust stacks. Not something you really want to have to fix, um, though. So hopefully they will get that figured out. 
and hopefully they will get me the correct parts. All right, so as you can see, the next phase is underway, and that is now adding filler. I didn't have to do much uh, on the uh, fuselage. Got a little bit there on the spine. Got this thing all smoothed up with no filler, which is what I wanted. Uh, if I'd had to use some there, it would have been sprue goo because this is all going to get rescribed and re riveted. Uh, but uh, I think I'm in pretty good shape there. I will probably go ahead and put just some spot primer on this before I scribe it, though, because. You know, what's the point of scribing before you know that all of your sanding is done and you don't know all your sanding is done until you know that all your scratches have been removed and the best way to diagnose that is with a little bit of spot primer. All right, now we get to the fun part of a Mustang. You can see that I have filler slathered all over the upper and lower surfaces of this wing as well as the leading edge. Now before I forget, you're asking what filler is that? Okay, it's this. This is Combo Spot Putty. It's a single part lacquer based filler. It's really pretty similar to Bondo 907, but I like it better because it is a little denser. It's a little harder to sand, but still nothing like super glue uh, and not even as hard as sprue goo. Um, but because it's a little bit denser, you get a smoother finish. Uh, you don't get as much of that sort of texture differential that you can see once you start putting primer on it. Um, it just it just really is a nice product, uh, and it thins really well with lacquer thinner. Just plain old hardware store lacquer thinner. You can see that's what I've got going on here, where I just mixed it up uh, into a, a really syrupy mix that makes it easy to apply precisely with a tiny little scratch, you know, scrap brush. Um, and that's, you know, that's how I like to, to apply my fillers is uh, in the minimum way possible. So this is good stuff. Unfortunately, I, I believe it is only available in the United States. I mean, there are equivalents elsewhere. Uh, Rob Knight, one of our SMCG guys, found some stuff in Germany that was real similar. So it's out there. You just have to hunt for it. But it's good stuff. Um, and also, I guess I should say, why did I use a lacquer-based filler for all of this instead of sprue goo, which I think some of you guys know is my favorite? And the answer is really simple. When I go through the sort of decision tree on which filler to use, the first question is, can I sand it? Well, the obvious answer is yes. This is easy to sand. It's wide open. Next question is, is there going to be any rescribing or re-riveting? And it's a hard no. All of these are just going to get filled, smoothed, and painted. So in that case, why would I why would I mess with sprue goo and deal with the drying time or any you know any of that? This is by far the simplest and most effective answer. Now, one thing you people are going to say, oh, you know, but it shrinks. Well, yeah, I mean, if any kind of paint material or putty material shrinks as it dries. And I don't know if that's really technically shrinkage or if, again, it's just the carrier, the solvent, whatever you want to call it, leaving that, um, you know, leaving that material. But as you can see, that will leave you a little bit, you know, you'll still see the line. Now, does that go all the way down into the original line? I don't know yet and I won't know until I sand it. And if I have to put some more on, then I will, no big deal. But what I do is as I'm working it, I put on two or three layers, you know, while I'm, while I'm in there to hopefully get it built up enough that when I sand it down, it's flush. So, Let's get into the uh, actual reasons for doing all this in the first place. Okay, one of the things that you will hear frequently in model making forums when the subject of Mustangs comes up is Mustang wings were filled with putty and sanded smooth and painted. Okay, that comment is not wrong, but it is also not exactly correct because it's not the entire wing. Okay, uh, and if you want to learn uh, a lot about, probably more than you ever wanted to know, about exactly what was done, let me recommend this book right here. This 
is a book that I've talked about on my channel before. It is an absolutely wonderful book. I think it's probably safe to say that this is the definitive publication on the subject. Um, this came out in 2015. Uh, he clearly did a shit ton of research, and it is chock full of amazing photos uh, from North Americans' archives and just a lot of information about how the Mustang uh, evolved and was manufactured. It's just really, really good. Now, there's plenty of stuff in here about the wings. All right, and the fundamental thing that you have to know about a Mustang wing is that it was one of the first ones where they really tried to incorporate what's called laminar flow. And what laminar flow is, uh, is uh, when, when you have a fluid passing over the surface of anything, really, I mean, a wing is just one thing. It can be, you know, down the inside wall of a, of a sewer pipe or a water pipe or through the nozzle of a jet engine, whatever it is. Whenever fluid flows across a surface, it can do one of two things. It can either just go straight across, you know, so imagine that it draws a line or forms a smooth sheet, okay? That's what you would like. That's the smoothest flow. That's the most efficient. That produces the least drag. But what often happens is that instead of just flowing smoothly and, and attached very closely to that surface, the fluid will tumble. So it starts spinning around and making eddies and currents and doing all kinds of crazy things. And that's a big part of what produces drag. So what North American did to, uh, to produce as much laminar flow on their wing as possible was first of all, they designed the profile of the airfoil in order so that it would produce laminar flow. And they tested it in the wind tunnel. That was something that North American was famous for. It was a lot of wind tunnel testing. Once they had the profile figured out, because it really does depend on shape, all right? Like if you just take a, uh, you know, uh, a brick and, you know, like let's say it's this can, all right? And you pass airflow over this can, all right? It's gonna slip smoothly over this curved portion, but then it's gonna start to tumble and back here, it's just going to, you know, become chaotic. So if you have an airfoil, then obviously you're a lot better off. But not just any old airfoil is going to work. So first of all, North American had to de design the airfoil properly to get the right shape so that it was going to produce laminar flow. Now the next thing they had to do was look at the surface finish. Because obviously, if the surface finish is really rough, if it's got a lot of protrusions sticking out of it or whatever, that's going to cause that flow to become turbulent. So what they started doing was experimenting with smoothing and filling the surface of the wing so that all of the little ridges and edges formed by the joints between the panel lines, all the rivets, all of those things were not there to kick up any turbulence. So. By doing that, uh, what they learned was that they could maintain laminar flow over about 70% of the wing, which is pretty good. You can't guarantee that it's gonna that it's gonna be there for the entire wing, but they could maintain laminar flow over most of the surface of the wing by only completely filling and smoothing the first 40% of the cord. All right, the cord is the curved line that goes from back, from front to back over the surface of an airfoil. Actually, that's not right. I think the cord may just be the straight line point between the leading edge and the trailing edge. <laughs> Either way, can't remember. I'm a mechanical engineer, not an aeronautical engineer, so don't, don't kill me on that. Anyway, Bottom line is that for the front 40% of the wing, all they had to do was completely fill and smooth that to get that result. So what they did, and this is described in the book, is they used a, uh, they, first of all, they primed the, the wing with zinc chromate primer. 
And when I say they primed the wing, it's also important to note that that did not include, and none of this includes, the control surfaces. Ailerons and flaps were not part of that. Nor were the landing gear doors or these things right here that they call the fuel doors. Basically, if you take these panels off, the gas tanks are underneath those. Those were not part of this process. All right. So what they did was is they, they primed the remaining part of the wing with zinc chromate. Then for that front 40%, they used a filler that was applied and sanded smooth. And then over the top of that, they used a material called a, a Acme Surfacer. That's just basically a high build primer and that went on the rest of the wing to basically, you can kind of see where it sort of smooths out some of these rivet lines when you, when you zoom in there real close. Now, how much of that leaves the panel lines and rivets visible on the back portion of the wing is, you know, it's debatable. But there's really not much debate about that front portion. You can see in that picture right there. Very... Uh, uniformly covered and smooth and by the time they got all this done and then sprayed all of these surfaces with DuPont silver lacquer you have what is the typical Mustang wing which does not show any panel lines or rivets to speak of other than what is there because of the access panels for the guns so that's why you've got this weird pattern uh, of filler that I've got on here where it only covers certain lines. And you can see from photographs that this little access panel for the landing gear right here was left in bare aluminum. So I'm keeping that the way it is. But the rest of it sanded smooth. The uh, wing tip, they left that with, with the rivets and the panel line as far as, as I can tell. So that's why you've got that pattern. Now, Edward did us all a favor by not molding any rivets into the surface of the wing the way that they did, that they, that they did on the fuselage. So that's pretty cool. Big props to them for, for that. And apparently there was a lot of discussion that went on at Edward about whether or not they should make the wing entirely smooth uh, or leave some panel lines because you know, there's plenty of model makers who just insist that they need some panel lines for visual interest. I personally, especially after spending an hour and a half spreading all this out, and who knows how long I'll spend sanding it down, I really would have preferred that they did it all. But hey, you can't have everything, right? So uh, anyway, that's the next thing is to get all this smoothed down. I should also point out, I'm pretty sure that uh, one of these uh, oval things is not supposed to be there. And I think it's the one on the starboard side, that little thing right there. Okay, since I'm still sitting here at the bench, I thought I'd show you guys this. Uh, I, I, was, I was remembering correctly, it is in fact the one on the port side that stays put. You can see that photograph right there. There's that access hatch on the top left side. Here's another really cool picture. Uh, you can see uh, both of these uh, are the, uh, there's, the, there's a completed lower surface of a wing. Pretty cool right there. Looks like he's got the pylons on that one. I kind of blew that off because I didn't know if they'd, be, if they'd be there at the factory. Oh well. Anyway, uh, there's the upper surface finished out. Now, here's a really interesting thing. If you could zoom in on this, and you may be able to see it well enough, all right, all of what you're seeing here, that's not riveting. That is print that uh, basically it says all clad 24 ST. And that basically is just uh, stamping or, or printing, whatever it is you want to call it, that identifies the sheet material that goes on there, which was all clad. Uh, from Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America. And the 24ST means that it was a 2400 series alloy, which means that it's Duralumin, basically also called aircraft aluminum, uh, and it's uh, alloyed with copper to make it stronger and tougher. 
And then, of course, with it being all clad, it's got a skin of pure aluminum on it to uh, give it a sacrificial corrosion layer. So that's that. Um, one other thing, because uh, I know somebody will probably take issue with this. Um, this little portion of the panel lines right here uh, behind the gun doors, that's, to me, I treat that as kind of debatable. You'll see photographs that show those little sections uh, clearly visible and other photographs clearly not visible. So it's kind of, you know, whichever one you want. I chose to do to go ahead and fill them in with all the rest. All right, let's take a quick look at this thing after the next phase. As you can see, all of the excess uh, filler has been sanded off. I still need to come back and do some touch-ups. I need to fill in and sand this thing right here. But I just want to show you kind of where it's at. Um, the uh, sanding, uh, pretty straightforward. I do uh, all that with water and with 600 grit. Uh, that's pretty good for knocking down a combi. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit harder than some other lacquer-based putties I've used without being brittle like uh, like the Tamiya stuff is, for example. But I make the job a lot faster with power tools. This thing right here, my little Proxon pin sander. I love this little machine. I got it hooked up to my foot feed like my other tool Proxon tools. And when you kick it, well, if I could find the foot pedal. There it is. See? It gets busy. It's an angry little buzzing bee kind of thing. And with a piece of double-sided tape and a piece of 600 grit wet or dry aluminum oxide paper, it will rip through putty in a big hurry. Uh, and it actually, because it moves so fast, it leaves a smoother finish than, than you might think. Uh, I mean, you can see that's all that's all 600 grit and it's pretty good. Now, one thing to uh, notice, um, let me flip it over here to a spot where I know that this will be visible. Uh, okay, so maybe you'll be able to see this. All right, so when you zoom in here, okay, you may see, all right, you look right in there next to in that line kind of right in the middle of the screen you may see some little divots pinholes bubbles whatever you want to call them I know I've got a couple over here right in that corner if it will there it is okay some relic some pretty big ones in that corner so uh, what's happening there, um, that look, that's just part of the deal with pretty much any kind of filler, especially the more liquid it is. Um, it's kind of, uh, of a good news, bad news thing. Uh, if, you, if you add thinner to it and make it more liquid, it's a lot faster and easier to uh, paint it and control it and put it exactly where you need it without a bunch of excess. But, because it's liquid, it will tend to form little bubbles and pinholes. Uh, I mean, that happens with every kind of filler that I've used that, that's like that. Um, sprue goo does it. Uh, Lacquer-based putties do it. Um, the only way to avoid the little pinhole bubbles is, to, is for your material to be really pasty. Like, for example, if you use Milliput or... Aves uh, epoxy sculpt, okay, something like that, um, or even if you use a lacquer-based filler without without thinning it at all, well, it's really thick and pasty. It's not going to form bubbles, but you have to mash it down into the void that you're trying to fill, and that means you're going to have a lot of excess, and so you have that penalty. So you kind of with all these materials, with all these methods. It's sort of always, there's always a compromise of some kind. And what you have to do is figure out what is the least 
uh, offensive of the compromises based on your, you know, your desired result. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. Now, here's another thing that some, some, some people will bring up uh, with regard to lacquer-based fillers. Like some clown on the internet uh, yesterday was going on about how this is a solvent-based material, which is stupid to start with because, look, everything that's liquid is a solvent. Water is a solvent if you're a dirt clod, okay? So, yes, this is a lacquer-based material. I use lacquer thinner to, to make it more liquid. And, yes, it does attack plastic. But he, this guy was saying, well, this is going to sit in there and it's going to soften the plastic. And then two weeks later, you're going to have sink marks. He wanted to bet me five bucks. I'm like, really? What are we 12 right now? Let's bet a thousand. Anyway, that's just ridiculous because, yes, if you have a giant wad of something like Bondo 907 or Squadron Green Putty or Tamiya Putty or Combi or whatever sitting on your on your model for any length of time, yeah, it very well may soften it to the point of deforming it. Ask any guy who's tried to glue a bunch of lead nose weights into an airplane model using Squadron Green Putty and then come back the next day and find the whole nose halfway melted off. Yes, believe me, it has happened. Fortunately, not to me, but I've seen people post about it on Facebook. I don't know what happened. I don't know why the nose melted. And, you know, when you start asking questions, it's like, okay, this is exactly why the nose melted. Don't do that. Any kind of, of material that involves the components that are in lacquer thinner, acetone, xylene, toluene, those are all very hot and they will melt styrene. Hey, guess what? That's exactly what's in Tamiya Extra Thin. If you use too much of it, you can end up with a sink mark. But it's all about quantity. And the quantities that are involved right here, not going to be a problem. So I do not anticipate having any sinking or shrinking or whatever you want to call it. Now, what I might have is where I've got all these pinholes, especially is if I just shot a thin layer of primer over this and then painted it, there might be some telltales underneath here, underneath the paint where all these lines are. And some people will call those ghost seams. Now, I personally think that what ghost seams are is oftentimes it's from differential sanding because unless it's sprue goo, the material in the joint is either harder or softer than the surrounding material. And if it's softer, then what you may be doing is actually just sanding a little deeper in the joint. Probably not with a joint that's as narrow as this or a gap that's as narrow as this. But you can also get differences in texture that will show up. This is why I don't use one reason. I don't use materials like Perfect Plastic Putty. It's really soft and porous, and when you, when you paint over it, the difference in texture shows up and it looks bad. Now that can happen even with a lacquer-based putty. And by the way, the main reason to use lacquer-based putty on something like this, as opposed to, uh, you know, using perfect plastic putty or like that Vallejo stuff, is because a is exactly because of what we're talking about. A lacquer-based material is going to bond with the substrate. A water-based material won't, and it, you know, it it might fall out uh, a year later. Um, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've but I've had to re-caulk more than a few bathroom fixtures because the caulk basically fell out of the joint years down the road. Now, that's a lot worse than having a little bit of shrinkage or a little bit of a ghost seam. But again, to get back to taking care of these little pinholes, to sealing this so that it's all uniform, that's what primer is for. And so what I'll do when I go to prime this is I'm going to spot prime first and I'm going to just spray you know, a very heavy layer all, all along all these lines and I'm going to check them and make sure that they're good. And when I lightly sand that primer, that should take care of any of that difference in texture or the little pinholes or whatever. If I have some pinholes that are a little too big for that, like these right here, 
I've showed you guys this before. What I have is this bottle of sludgy old all clad 309 micro filler primer. And I will just use it with a brush and I will brush it on uh, and it will, because it's lacquer and all this stuff is lacquer, uh, it'll bond with it and it'll make a nice little pinhole filler that will sand down real easily within like half an hour. So that'll take care of all that and I'll show you what it looks like after that phase is done. Okay, so just a quick check in here. I am uh, busily spraying uh, spot primer on uh, all of these uh, panel lines that I've filled. And I just want to show you this because this is something that I've talked about. All right, so take a look at this. You can see that you can still see the panel lines. All right, call them ghost seams, call them whatever you want. This is what I've been talking about with the remnants of the, uh, the filler showing there. And this is not shrinkage, it's not, you know, there's nothing crazy going on there. It's just simply two things. One is you've got a difference in texture, and the other is that there are still some pinholes see those pretty well on that one right there so look that's just part of the deal that's naturally going to show so what to do well you do this right here Alright, so spot priming. I basically have an extremely thin filler in my airbrush. This is Mr. Surfacer 1500 and it's a lacquer primer and it's got filler in it so what I'm doing is I'm just hosing it on those joints and then the idea is that when I sand that down it's going to get rid of most of those little imperfections. If I still have some pinholes that are too big, then what I'll do is I'll come back with some of this uh, with a brush and I'll just really stab it into those little stubborn spots, but this will take care of most of it. You'll see that uh, when I come back and I'll show it to you after I sand it. Okay, so just a quick look. Uh, this is what the thing looks like after I went back and hosed a bunch of extra primer on all those pinholes. And again, I don't know why I had so many on the bottom. This might have been a case where I would have been better off to actually use the uh, combi full strength and smear it into those grooves as opposed to trying to paint it in there real thin. I don't know, but it's, it's really not too big of a deal because um, most of those are gonna get sanded out. And you can see that over here on this side, which was just as bad and when I use the magic power of a strong side light you can see that uh, everything is pretty smooth now the idea with this is not to sand all the way through it so like right here I had to keep working it to get the pinholes out and I went all the way through so that putty is probably going to show through again when I go back with my next layer of primer because again just that texture difference but I feel like all of my pinholes on this side are taken care of same thing I've done uh, all of the top side and so you can kind of see what I'm trying to get to and this is why I like to use these lacquer materials and, and especially to use lacquer primer as that last uh, as that last bit of, of micro filler because it just sands down so easily and so smoothly. So what I'm using here is uh, just a little piece of 600 grit wet or dry paper. Um, and once I get everything uh, cut down flat, then I come back, quick pass with the sponge, 
then another quick pass at 800 grit, and I'm good. It's really pretty quick and easy. The, the, the reason why I don't use the 600 grit sponge to start with is because it's just so soft that it takes forever even to completely flatten out that little bit of, of irregularity in the primer. So because your fingertip is a slightly stiffer backing than a sponge, a piece of paper actually cuts a lot faster and, 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 and flattens it uh, much more effectively. Okay, so here we go, next phase. As you can see, I've now got primer all over the whole thing. And uh, this, is, this is pretty good to show you, I think, because I, I, it seems like a lot of guys uh, sort of miss out on or ignore the uh, benefit of primer as a diagnostic tool. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important reasons to use it because, look, anytime you start screwing with the surface of these things, it becomes a lot harder to actually see the flaws. And uh, black primer in particular just makes it much, much easier to see what's going on. And this is a really clear illustration of that because as you can see, I've got a uh, you know a pretty uh, uniform layer of primer on there not you know not overly thick it's like you know it's like a standard two layer spray job okay and you can see a couple things going on all right like all of these areas that I had really sanded out where I spot primed before I sanded those down to either six or eight hundred I forget which but they have a markedly different texture. Uh, than the areas that were just bare plastic before. Okay, you can really see that right there. Okay, and you can even see things like right there is a place, if you look in the corner there by the handle of that gun door, you can see what looks like a scratch, and it was. I was cleaning paint out of those panel lines, and my scriber jumped, and I made a scratch that I then filled in with uh, some lacquer primer and sanded it down flush and smooth but you can see that it still shows there because of the text you know it's, it's just different texture all right so you've got uh, you've got all that going on there you can also see all right this gets into the subject of ghost seams or whatever you want to call them okay look uh, right there okay there it is to the to the right of that right most machine gun you can see where panel lines come together in a little bit of a T and there's a little bit of a ghost seam there for whatever reason you know for all the the reasons that I've talked about already all right and I didn't get it completely flushed with my previous operations right there you can see okay right in the middle of the screen you can see a kind of a curved line okay what that is that's a place where my spot primer didn't get feathered out completely on the edge when I was sanding it down, and there's a little bit of a lip there uh, that's just that's just primer underneath that. So you can see the level of 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 uh, you know flaws that that primer will reveal to you because this this is stuff that's like a thousandth of an inch tall, all right. And the reason that I've got some shiny spots you know, right here in these two places that I was talking about and then over there is because I went ahead and added some some spot primer to those in preparation for sanding those down. And the key here is with sanding those down is is that you're trying to not sand all the way through it and get back to bare plastic. That's exactly what you don't want to do. The idea is to unify the surface to get the whole thing to where it's covered in a layer of primer that's uniformly smooth. And that's what I've got going on on these other three sections that I've already sanded out. So you can see right here, okay, on this area, that's nice and uniformly smooth. I've sanded that down to where everything was leveled out and then uh, sanded it to 800 grit and that's plenty smooth enough to get a nice smooth layer of 
LP11 on there when it's time to make it look like DuPont aluminum lacquer. Oh, except for right there. I still have to fix that for some stupid reason. I was thinking that that joint right there was actually a panel line, and then it occurred to me, yeah, it's not on the top, so yeah, probably need to take care of that. So got to fix that. Had a couple of other things show up. Um, has some uh, little pinholes in the leading edge seam that I needed to take care of, and I've put some, some lacquer primer on those to fill those. Uh, so I'm getting pretty close to it. Now I know that a lot of guys look at this sort of roundy round process as being really frustrating. And I get that. It kind of is because you just want to be done and move on, right? And, and every time you go through this, you think you've got it and everything is super smooth. And you look at it through your magnifier and you're like, shit, one more thing to fix. But look, I, I just would encourage you to embrace that process because that's just what it takes to get really good finishes. It, you know, it's, it is. It's just a matter of working through the defects. And they become fewer and smaller uh, as, you, as you do that. Uh, so, you know, you just have to, you just have to, to get next to it. Uh, here you can see, I, this is the first bit of spot primer I've done on the fuselage. And you can see, you know, that's pretty horrible right there where I scraped down the uh, step, I got a lot of work to do right there. Um, the chin uh, looks pretty nice and smooth. The nose, however, revealed an issue that I couldn't see in gray plastic. All right, and it's really obvious with the black primer on there. And that is that when I was scraping down that seam, because it was a little high on one side, I basically dug a real shallow trench. Okay, and again, you can't see that unless the light falls on it correctly to give it a little bit of, of relief. All right, but it's, it's a little bit high over here on this side. So I'm going to have to start working on that to uh, get that smoothed down. And yeah, I'm going to lose some more rivets, but I'm going to have to re-rivet and re-scribe that section anyway. You can also see, didn't get the uh, back part back there completely filled. So got some work to do there. But this looks good. I also installed this fillet um, and I just picked one because again, I'm making a generic Mustang. So who knows if, you know, it's, it's not really important for it to be the exact correct one. They give you two options. Uh, but I did have a little bit of an issue getting it to fit perfectly. It uh, did not want to go all the way in uh, the way it was supposed to. And I took care of that by just lightly relieving the material along this edge right here and then the, the vertical edge right there at that little notch so that in effect this fillet piece would move a little further aft. Uh, and that would allow it to drop completely in up here at the front. So that was that was relatively easy to diagnose and take care of. So anyway, I think that's about enough for this segment. Uh, when we come back, all of this body work will be done and we'll go on from there. Okay, so there you go. I hope you found that useful. Um, you know, this is just one of those things that if you want to do an Edward, or uh, really any Mustang, not just the Edward Mustang, and you really want to make that wing look like they did out of the factory, pretty much with every kit out there, you've got some body work to do. And it, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, it can be a little frustrating, it can take some time, but if you're persistent and uh, dedicated, then, uh, you know, the results are, are worthwhile. This is actually the most body work that I've done in quite a while. And, um, I'm more convinced now than ever uh, after what probably ended up being, oh, I don't know, in some parts of this wing, probably six or eight rounds of uh, prime sand paint, or not paint, but prime sand, prime sand, prime sand, <laughs> that um, what we call ghost seams uh, and, you know, blame on... Uh, everything from uh, filler shrinkage to filler reacting with the primer to bench fairies uh, is actually 
more often than not just a case of poor vision and insufficient sanding because I, you know, the, for all of the ones that I kept having to go back and work on, it was pretty clear that I just hadn't sanded them down enough. I had plenty of primer piled up on top of them, but I just had not sanded it completely level. And I just, you know, I just had to keep working it. And it, a, a big part of, of continuing to see those things pop out where I hadn't seen them before was looking at the thing in different light. Daylight, nighttime you know, right underneath my bench light, just, you know, different angles, different ways. And and there were also things that I just didn't notice. I had one really big pockmark on the starboard wing that I didn't notice until I thought I was completely done. I thought it was supposed to be there. And then I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't have a matching thing on the left side. That's a <laughs> that's a problem so you know again i i mean it's you know it's it's easy to blame stuff on on uh, ghosts but i think that more often than not it's really just us and you just have to work harder so anyway that's that and uh when we get back to this thing next hopefully i will actually be into some foiling because this wing is now ready uh for its uh dressing of LP11, which hopefully will look wonderful. I expect that it will, but I think after considering it, I'm going to probably end up needing to put the foil uh, parts on the wing before I do that. Um, that's uh, here on these fuel tank doors, and then these little inspection panels right here. Those are going to be tricky. I think I'm going to go ahead and get those on there before I paint and then mask them off. So we'll see. But I'll see you next episode. As always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.